Welcome to Nice Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. Let me start with some macro thoughts because it's a real rat-a-tat environment at the moment. Beijing has accused Donald Trump of blackmail and warns it would retaliate in kind after the US president threatened to impose fresh tariffs on Chinese goods. This is a short primer from uh, Bloomberg. What you may have missed on Trump's tariffs and China's response. Chinese stocks plunged. Uh, European stocks have opened lower as fears of a trade war hit the markets. I'll get into this a little bit more in a moment, but uh, clearly quite a fraught uh, background to things at the moment. Home thoughts. We must all admit that everything is fine and there's no need in the world to worry. That's the Daily Kerouac. Then I came across this about Kilimanjaro. Climate change is happening, humans are causing it, and I think this is perhaps the most serious environmental issue facing us. That's Bill Nye. Since the beginning of the last century, the icy surfaces on Mount Kilimanjaro decreased by 82%, and one of the mountain's three main peaks is currently without an ice cap, a condition that has not happened for at least 11,000 years. This is a photograph of the snow peaks of Kilimanjaro that I took as we flew over on, the, on our way down south. Alberto Giacometti is a Swiss painter and sculptor this photograph is seen at his studio. This is from René Burri via Magnum Photos. Giacometti was once asked where his works would go if they left the studio. He replied, bury them in the earth, like that they may be a bridge between the living and the dead. These ideas of decay and impermanence, which Giacometti connected to the horrors of the Holocaust, and his post-war existentialist beliefs were manifested in the crumbling flesh of his bronze figures, such as Walking Man 1. Bury them in the earth like that they may be a bridge between the living and the dead. I don't think the dead are really dead, personally. Long Ki March, The Walking Man, this is by Giacometti, is a bronze cast sculpture of a six foot tall man mid stride. In every work of art, the subject is primordial, whether the artist knows it or not, he said. The measure of the formal qualities is only a sign of the measure of the artist's obsession with his subject. The form is always in proportion to the obsession. Political reflections, why are immigrant children and parents being separated? The thought that any state would seek to deter parents by inflicting such abuse on children is unconscionable, said the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Couldn't agree with him more. Then, just to give you a flavor of the direction of travel, this is the Italian Interior Minister he wants a census of Roma communities. Unfortunately, we will have to keep the Italian Roma because we can't expel them, he said. Hervé, who alerted me to this, said it sounds like the black shirts are back in the streets of Italy. So let's return to Trump. He's directed the US trade representative to identify $200 billion worth of Chinese goods for tariffs. However, the Chinese response is very, very sharp um, and they are actually responding uh, in the farm belt. Um, Trump's tariff battle with key buyers of US apples, soybeans and corn threatens the support of some of his biggest backers. US farmers now seeing their livelihoods in jeopardy. Farmers overwhelmingly supported Trump in the 2016 election, welcoming how he championed rural economies and vowed to repeal estate taxes that often hit family farms hard. 
Now those same farms are seeing crop prices fall and export markets shrink after Trump's tariffs triggered a wave of retaliation from buyers of U.S. apples, cheese, potatoes, bourbon and soybeans. A lot of people in the ag community were willing to give President Trump benefit of the doubt. Now the impact is really starting to hit. It is not something you can just take lightly. Um, even before trading partners imposed tariffs, U.S. farmers were facing a tough year. Net farm income was expected to fall 6.7% to $59.5 billion in 2018, according to the U.S. Agriculture Department. Last week, Trump imposed $50 billion in tariffs on China. Beijing retaliated with a 25% tariff on U.S. soybeans and other goods starting July 6, sending soybean futures to a two-year low and throwing into doubt forecasts for U.S. soybean exports to rise 11% this year. And I concluded by saying that Trump has a bazooka, Xi Jinping has a very precise scalpel and it reminds me of Laurence Olivier in the movie Marathon Man. Is it safe? He asked Dustin Hoffman as he fiddled around with his mouth. This trade war could lead to growing nationalism in China to boycott all U.S. products, an observer says. This is one of the typical Chinese responses, and it's worked quite effectively. As a result of Trump's strategic incoherence, Japanese leader Shinzo Abe is promoting a rapprochement with Beijing that reflects Tokyo's need for allies in upholding the post-war free trading system. Wall Street Journal. And I think that's a very big deal, and it was in fact prefaced by the photograph Angela Merkel's office released at the G7, where Abe Shinzo is seen standing arms folded, kind of, we are done here. China's trillion dollar sharp power plays, in the Sydney Morning Herald, it's a new economic order, it's rewriting the political map. More than 70 countries, a trillion dollars in virtually limitless ambition, are bound up in China's Belt and Road Initiative. But is this a benign economic plan or the rise of a new empire? And how will it affect us? The Chinese call it Yi Dai Yi Lu, One Belt, One Road. A revival of that nation's mythological transcontinental land and sea silk roads. But behind the romance is a hard nosed plan that's staggeringly ambitious. A trillion dollars or more spent on hundreds of infrastructure projects, co funded and mostly built by China in 70 or more countries. The Belt Road Initiative is about railways, ports, roads, pipelines, power stations, industrial parks, and much more. It's a trade block revolving around China. It's rules and standards written by Chinese companies. Economic cooperation zones, financial regulation, high-speed internet, direct investment. It's about education, culture, health, tourism, foreign relations, and politics. It's being likened by some, including China, to the Marshall Plan, a bid to anchor China's economic and political place in the world by exerting a mix of hard, soft, and steely sharp power. Seventy countries have signed the memorandum to collaborate. A raft of other Second Division countries are sympathetic. Covers 4.4 billion people, 40% of global GDP. China expects its annual trade with countries along BRI routes to surpass $2.5 trillion within the next decade. Silk Road Economic Belt, the Maritime Silk Road, Arctic Silk Road is also on the cards. Economic corridors are strategic lines of economic development across national borders that include transport infrastructure, trade zones, customs and border controls and connectivity. There is an inherent duality in the facilities that China is establishing, which are ostensibly commercial, but quickly upgradable to carry out essential military missions, Abhijit Singh. Sharp power is an emerging term describing manipulating and pressuring other countries to guide, buy or coerce 
political influence. China is courting the Pacific Islands. The Philippines leader, Rodrigo Duterte, has effectively given up his country's opposition to China's actions in the South China Sea. Estimates of the total value of China's investments in BRI projects range from an impressive $340 billion to a mind-boggling $1 trillion. Then saying Sovereign Wealth Fund, the Silk Road Fund, and the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank make the investments mostly in the form of interest-bearing loans. They are supposed to be commercial loans to be repaid with interest. Rates vary, but in the Philippines it's said that the rate is 2 to 3 percent, much higher than the Japanese alternative. And on some projects in Pakistan's economic corridor, rates are up to 8 percent, although in many cases they are being renegotiated. Um, Belt of Road can also lead to a problematic increase in debt, potentially limiting other spending as debt service rises and creating balance of payment challenges. Um, talking about Sri Lanka unwilling to serve as an $8 billion loan at 6% interest that was used to finance the construction of its Hanban Toto deep water port. China agreed in July 2017 to a debt for equity swap, which included a 99 year lease for managing the port. China took over the port in what some have described as debt trap diplomacy, civil strife ensued. Then also a similar scenario unfolded in Tajikistan. And this is what I was writing about in my weekend piece uh, on the 18th of June, and I was talking about how African countries have got to avoid being hanban toted and that the first overarching point is that creditors are not Santa Claus and miscues will exact a very heavy price. And then in August 2017, I wrote about Xi Jinping's One Belt, One Road program binds the world to Beijing because all the roads and railways have but one destination, that is China. I said then Washington has metasized into an epicenter of risk, Donald Trump refers. And talk of a unipolar US-dominated world have largely evaporated. President Putin refused to be rolled over by a Victoria Newland-inspired color revolution in the Ukraine and drew a line in the sand. And one of the collateral consequences of that was to send President Putin into the very ready embrace of Xi Jinping. In fact, far from being a unipolar world, we have entered a bipolar or even a tripolar world, US, China, and Russia. I also said then the pivot to Asia, which was supposed to contain China, is dead in the water. China has sprung that trap. Let's move on to international markets. Euro dollar 115.82. Dollar index pushing on 94.75. Japanese yen caught a bid 109.75. Swiss franc 0.9929. The pound has fallen below 132, 131.97. The Australian dollar has been taking a beating, 0.7370. India rupee 68.205. South Korean one eleven ten thirty four. The real 374.75. Egyptian pound 17.8703. And the rand lower still at 13.8770. Dollar index is a three month chart. We're back on the 2018 highs. Let's see where we go from here. The reason for dollar strength is is evidenced in the gap between two-year bond yields in the US and Germany, which has now grown to a whopping three percentage points. And that suggests a euro-dollar rate of roughly 0.90. I'll put up a chart of the euro-dollar. I still think we're going down to 114.50. That was my target when we were close to 120. Australian dollar, um, this is a chart from Rafi, but have a look at how we've broken down now to 0.7370. Gold, that's at 1282.50 uh, last. WTI crude oil is at $65.23. Of course, it had a very steep fall and then recovery yesterday, but now it's falling back a little bit again. Emerging markets, I wrote a while back, this has all the ingredients for making a good old fashioned crisis. Have a look at this local currency, emerging market bonds are down 11% since January in dollars. Sub-Saharan Africa, the people of Tigray are still begging for a drop of water. TPLF, the party, is not the people of Tigray. That is the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. Um, making a passionate plea to diffuse tensions within other parts of the country. 
I, in response to a tweet from Ken Apalo, I said, Adli Ahmed is moving so fast, everything around him looks so static and wooden. And I think those comments he's just made about T. Grahams, um, that's a political coup de grace. It's decapitating the leadership from the people in a very subtle way. Um, and then returning to my piece on the weekend, I said, you know, Abi Ahmed has read the writing on the wall and hence his economic pivot, which caught his own party and the rest of the world off guard. He said yesterday, we are in debt, we have to pay back, but we can't. And secondarily, we aren't able to finish the projects we have started. Um, and I said, again, going back to my article over the weekend, in these moments, being ahead of the curve pays exponential dividends, and the mercurial Abbey is delivering on all fronts. I think he saw very clearly how Sri Lanka got hamban toted. Uh, we've already discussed that. And, uh, and essentially was trying to avoid such a denouement. And then uh, uh, Ken from Washington says, I hope he succeeds. A hundred million dreams depend on it. And I went back to Victor Hugo, there is nothing like a dream to create the future. Ethiopia will offer a 30 to 40 percent stake in state-run telecoms monopoly Ethio Telecom to large corporations and will split the firm in two to spur competition, he said. Um, shares will not be available for a year or two until an intensive study is undertaken. And then have a look at this summary that John Aglinby alerted me to. And it just describes what he said in Parliament yesterday, and it really is a deep insight into his thinking. Mozambique armed groups burned villages, 39 dead, more than a thousand displaced in recent attacks. Very curious situation there. Congo has cancelled the passport of its exiled opposition leader, Moishi Katumbi. He's apparently Italian. And in June 2016, I said Kabila, however, outwitted Moishi Katumbi by removing him from the street in the Congo entirely, and that this might well prove a cleverly administered technical knockout. Um, indeed, US is targeting Israeli businessman Dan Gertler with fresh sanctions. Um, the Treasury Department said Friday it had placed 14 companies with ties to Mr. Gertler on a sanctions list, which targets serious human rights abuse and corruption. Um, and uh, that's an interesting development. The U.S. is putting more pressure. It said Mr. Gerkley has used his close friendship with President Kabila to act as a middleman for mining asset sales in the DRC, requiring some multinational companies to go through Gerkley to do business with the Congolese state. As a result of Mr. Gerkley's actions, the Treasury said between 2010 and 2012 alone, DRC may have lost more than $1.36 billion in revenues from the underpricing of mining assets that were sold to offshore companies linked to the Israeli businessman. Shona Tiger, who's a friend of mine in Zimbabwe, tweeted this photograph of President Manangagwa. And I said, if that photo is anything to go by, it's working A++ from a Bartes point of view. Bartes used to love analyzing photography for the messages. Analyze that photograph for its message looking to the future, joie de vivre, I think it will resonate. Zimbabwe's split opposition helping Mugabe's successor to victory in May, the party held a so-called healing session to appease disgruntled members who had threatened to donate their votes to the opposition or stand as independents amid accusations of rigging and favoritism during primary elections. It's not the number of candidates that's worrying, but the phenomenon of rebels who are insisting on standing without the blessing of their parties. This is going to have an impact on both ZANU-PF and the MDC alliance. 5.6 million people are registered to vote in the election, which has attracted the interest of many first-time voters. I was born under ZANU-PF, and all I've known is poverty and suffering, said a Harare street vendor. For us, this is a vote for change. Malawi's former president, Joyce Bando, returned home in April after four years of self-imposed exile, so it says she intends to contest next year's election if chosen by her party. South African all shares down 3.81% year to date. Dollar versus Rando, my goodness, all of us Ramaphorians are running for cover 
last trading at 13.8770. Nigerian all shares up 1.79% this year. Ghana Stock Exchange is up 14.42% this year. My weekend piece was about the budget and my conclusion was we need to cut taxes, not increase them and we need to cast the net wider. In Africa, the average corporate tax is 28%, while it's 25% globally. The proposed 35% rate by the Kenyan government is one of the highest in the world. That's hardly going to help anything. And the increased excise duty on mobile money transfers will negatively impact mobile-led transfer services and payments and slow down the government's drive towards a cash-light economy. That's Satish Kamath, the CFO of Safaricom. Kamath said hiking duty on mobile payments would likely hurt the poor, most of whom do not have bank accounts and rely on mobile transfer services like M-Pesa. It would be unfortunate to reverse the gains we have made through mobile-led financial inclusion in the past few years, he said. Transcentury reported their full year 2017 results yesterday made some interesting reading. Full year revenue slumped 13.793%. Gross profit was down 39.964%. Um, operating expenses came down 26.088%. Um, operating loss was 3.64 billion, 303% worse than previously. Loss before income tax, 4.72 billion versus 1.61 billion. Um, EPS negative 10 shillings and 23 cents versus negative one shilling and 56 cents. They are, they've got a negative cash and cash equivalence position at the end of the year, 35.442 million. Now the auditor, a material uncertainty related to going concern section that draws attention to note 2F of the audited consolidated financial statements. Note 2F of the audited consolidated financial statements indicates that TransCentury incurred a loss of 4.3 billion shillings during the year. And as of that date, TransCentury's current liabilities exceeded current assets by 8.5 billion shillings. These events or conditions, along with other matters as set forth in Note 2F, um, indicate that a material uncertainty exists that may cause significant doubt on Transcentury PLC's ability to continue as a going concern. Um, engineering division recorded a 30% drop in revenues. They say it closed with the year with a 17 billion shilling order book. The power division more than doubled its order book, though it recorded a 32% drop in revenues. Our branch holdings director of communications, Vitaly Atal, who's also my sister-in-law, said in an interview that Java House will continue to power ahead with its expansion plans despite the provisional liquidation of the parent firm. She explained that Java House is under a fund managed by a branch investment management limited a private equity firm that has full ownership of the coffee chain. The PE fund also holds 10%, 21% and 56.2% in Brookside Seven Seas Technology and private healthcare provider Avenue Healthcare. Abraj Holdings is not the shareholder of Java House. The provisional liquidation for Abraj Holdings is a court supervised restructuring process which will ensure the company can move forward with an orderly restructuring. The Nairobi All Shares up 3.81% this year, but down 9.584% since setting a record on April 5. NAC20 is down 9.12%. And then finally, one of the final links is a link to any share that's listed at the stock market. If you want to dive into it and see what's happening, please do. And thank you for stopping by.